Stephen Wright, welcome to the Digital Dialogue to Western Sydney Unfiltered. Ironic for a couple of blokes who are never accused of ever being filtered at what we say, but um, we're given free reign today. Um, mate, before we kick off, obviously, uh, acknowledge country. The very, in an online world, this weird sense of acknowledging which country everybody's on as we speak, but maybe it's entirely appropriate as we're talking to the Land Council to acknowledge people live on the land now rather than those who are traditional connection, but to all uh, our original friends and those who make us welcome. From my mob who arrived here 200 and something years ago as involuntary tourists, to, to those who looked after the joint for 60,000 years, I say thank you very much and doing that. Um, Steve, Chief Operating Officer of the Derriman Aboriginal Land Council, the, the largest private landowner in, in Western Sydney, uh, probably the most successful um, urban land council in, in Australia. Um, and for your background, uh, welcome Welcome, welcome. Chris, thank you very much. Um, firstly, can I pass, up, pass on the Derriman Land Council's best wishes to you on the Western Sydney Leadership Dialogue team. As, as you know, we're very happy to be friends with you guys. You're a great outfit. Um, so Kevin and Athel on the board, thank you very much for the opportunity for letting me chat. And as you know, I'm the, I'm the white guy at Derriman. Um, and Derriman are very happy to push me into this conversation um, to help them help you understand where we're up to. So uh, I, like you, am the proud uh, descendant of um, people who were involuntary tourists. Um, and my my bosses at Derriman often laugh to me about that and say, you know, don't worry, we can always tell the convict taint. That's easy for us. So, <laughs> so well, in most so, cases, the <laughs> best, best, best thing ever happened to our relatives was getting kicked out of the old country too. It wasn't Absolutely. a bad landing spot. Absolutely. So I'm, I come as an emissary for Derriman and they're very thankful for the opportunity, Chris. Great. Mate, to talk about Derriman, as I said, we're in this unique situation in New South Wales um, of a Land Rights Act, as opposed to, you know, back in the in the 70s and 80s of the Rand government era, um, who went down a unique path of, of, of land ownership. The rest of the country more has come along in the Wick Marbo times of, of traditional ownership claims. Um, the reality is in most urban parts of Australia, there is no ongoing traditional ownership because of the tragedy of dispossession and annihilation and matters like that. But there are current, there are certainly a lot of people, indigenous people, living in those lands now who need an awful lot of help and have every right to to access um, available land as as their own. So maybe you might just give us for the for the uninitiated, um, you know, those of us all sit out there. We've got our wrap plan. We've said thank you to the people who arrived. We've done our black fill thing. But maybe in a more substantive sense, explain maybe the quick history of the land, in your involvement in land councils, and then we'll, we'll come back and talk a bit about Derriman specifically. Happy to, Chris. Um, I really think that the people of New South Wales need to realise that they actually have the preeminent Aboriginal land rights regime of any state or the Commonwealth in the country. It's been around since 1983. It is a child of uh, Neville Rand and Frank Walker's extremely good leadership in this state. And in fact, it goes all the way back to Gough Whitlam. And the reason it goes back to Gough Whitlam is Gough, Gough was very interested in national land rights, loved the T-shirt. Um, and he, he started a conversation about national land rights, which Fraser carried through, but only in those places the Commonwealth had authority to do so, which was the Northern Territory. I would have loved land rights in the ACT because it probably meant the new Parliament House would be owned by the Ngunnawal mob. So, so that unfortunately didn't happen, but they did it in the Territory. You wouldn't have needed a voice. They'd have just been the landlord. Would That's exactly fantastic. right. They could, have, they could just put it in the, in the, in the terms of the agreement. Um, so what... What was very important to realise was that it was the states and territories who constitutionally controlled land in New South Wales and other states, and they were the ones who refused land rights. So what, what Walker and, and what Neville Rand did was of international significance in allowing land rights to go forward, and it's the only state or territory that's done it in a meaningful way until the common law was established in '93 that native title had existed since before invasion. So it's a very historic piece of legislation. For my sins, I've been working in various parts of it since 1990. So um, I spent 90, the 1990s working for the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council. I ran their land rights, property and environmental practice. Um, and in those days, we were spending most of our time in the land environment court and above, um, taking as much land off the New South Wales Crown as we possibly could. 
and a lot, a lot left Crown control. A lot went to land councils. It was a very uneven distribution because there's 123, 120 land councils. I'm sorry, across New South Wales, and if you're Derebin and you cover seven local government areas in Western Sydney, the fastest growing region in Australia, and you own 17,000 hectares of land you are an extremely significant landholder, as well as being an Aboriginal organisation. If you're the Timberborough Local Land Council, you probably don't have the same economic worth, yep. but you have an equal amount of Aboriginal cultural authority in that area. And you also have some, even in those cases, have some interesting land um, to, to work with. So land rights is uneven, but it's a wonderful process because it's freehold land, Chris. Unlike native title, it's also which not finished. It's not historic now. Your Derriman and others are still making claims on obviously available, um, applicable crown, crown land, not private land. It's Every day. Land. So the, the category of land that's claimable has to be within the Crown Lands Act in New South Wales and just around the edges. So it's not national park. It's not private land. Not land owned by local government. So it's about finding that. And there's less and less of it because obviously the crowns. Got a little more canny after 30 years. And to of, some extent, it's become some lazy state assets and where they, they weren't paying attention. And you, we had, we've had a highly focused uh, land council group with a somewhat negligent, sometimes state group, and it's been pretty smart, some of the, the land that's been claimed. Absolutely. And both the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council and local land council have been very active over the years. There's been more than 40,000 claims lodged in the life of the Land Rights Act. There's, there's about 26,000 maybe a bit less now remaining to be determined. And the, the high number is because it's all small parcels because it's lot by lot. So unlike native title where native title claimants will say, we this is our country over vast ways of land, land rights in New South Wales is who owns lot one DP whatever, right? So it's a it's a focused contest, um, but it's a very interesting contest and it's it's ongoing. So in a way, black fellas covered a white fella, used white fellas rules and and been pretty successful. They've, they've played the lot, lots of land, prescribed bits of land, not a generic sense of traditional ownership, but there's an available lot of land there we've identified when making a claim on it using your legal system and a great success. So it's a... It is, Chris, and it's very interesting because you're, you're absolutely right. There, the, there is no direct traditional connection with the way land councils claim land. It's a, it's a compensation package for dispossession, right? So the land council in Western Sydney, Derebin, more than 20 different First Nations groupings make up the population and the membership of Derebin, highest Aboriginal population in New South Wales, the vast majority from other parts of New South Wales and Australia. So the land rights is a compensation for all of their dispossession over time. Yep. And that's often a criticism of land rights, that it doesn't account for that. The people I work for at Derebin would say, well, that's our business, how that's dealt with, not my business or your business. But secondly, historically, it was the Aboriginal leadership in Redfern in the 1960s and 70s. So all of those very prominent, very important members of the Aboriginal leadership group who said... People like you'll see, uh, Kevin Kavanagh. Absolutely. And, and all of the great names you could think of, they, they were consciously saying, you need to account for, our, for the way you've displaced us. So we need to be able to work from where we are now because it's, we, didn't, we didn't choose to leave our country. You made us. So it was a conscious decision... And it was never anticipated that native title would complicate it the way it has. But that's history, yeah. So before we go to Derriman's contemporary thing now, that, that history has led to some extent to a bit of, um, to the outside world, uh, so sometimes a conflict of land councils yeah. and the traditional owners who claim traditional yeah. ownership of some of those lands that, um, and it's been a bit pronounced in Western Sydney, let's be honest, there's been a yeah. Derriman, Darig, whatever you pronounce, whatever yeah. spell it, um, I think for some years. Um, do you, uh, uh, is the Indigenous side debilitated by that or is it just white society going, this is really hard to deal with because they're fighting and I don't know where to land? Because it Look, it's a, it's, a very, it's a very vexed problem and it's a very vexed problem for the Aboriginal community as much as it is for the wider community. Um, I, I don't think, having been involved in this issue across New South Wales and other parts of Australia for many years, I don't think there's ever an easy answer. Yep because the problem becomes the nature of colonisation and the patterns of colonisation, and that's the problem. And I think what I'd say at the moment is the problem is, is on steroids in Western Sydney, and some may say that's because of the conflict in the Aboriginal community, 
but I actually pinpoint the current problem to being government policy. And that government policy is an almost New South Wales government policy, which is an almost fetish-like desire to only think about country pre-invasion and not to think seriously about the 250-odd years of unwanted occupation. And it's, it's actually why there are those three parts to the Uluru Statement, because the Makarata process is designed to be a truth-telling process to help heal all Aboriginal people. So whether you're someone living in Windsor who knows their family goes back to what happened at the Sackville Mission, yeah, or you're someone from somewhere else in New South Wales who's been in Western Sydney for four or five generations, you should have a way to explain that and talk to each other about that, not have it exacerbated by government policy. So it's the hardest game in town, Chris. It's a very debilitating issue, but it needs a lot more work. Well, let's turn now. Contemporary success of Derriman, probably the, one of the most successful land councils in the in the country, and certainly New South Wales. As I said before, it's a bold title, the largest owner of private land in Western Sydney. And I think to initiate it, it's largely a northwestern Sydney spread for Derriman. So uh, to some extent, the Parramatta is, in fact, Parramatta Jail will come to, and it's almost very southeastern tip, and then an arc up to the mountains from um, from that with lots of land holdings in Penrith up in the hills district uh, and the mountains themselves. Is it, it's got to, I suppose, be empowering for the constituency of the land council to say, um, we don't need to come cap in hand anymore. We're, we're playing in your world. We're, we're, we're a bloody big landlord now. We're a developer. We have economic um, depend, independence that's going to come through through uh, utilisation and capitalisation of their own land asset. Sounds like a very Sydney thing. Oh, look, it's, a, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing turn of events is what it is that what, what land rights has done in the Sydney Basin, and it's not just Derribin. I mean, I would also have to mention the Metropolitan Local Land Council, Gandangara down in Liverpool, who have the benefit of the Eritropolis more than we do, and Thurwell down around Picton, which is on fire yep. as an area of, of Sydney, as you know. So the land councils in the Sydney Basin are by far the largest landowners of anybody, even bigger than the government, right? And what's most interesting is the reason Derriman asked me to come and give them a hand a few years ago was they were ready to go from the very tough fight of acquisition because none of this land has been given up to land councils by the government without a fight. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let them ever tell you acknowledging country at conferences is what they do when it comes to fighting land rights. So... <laughs> So that, that's that been a hard struggle. And when Derribin said it's time to activate, they asked me and others to come and assist them. And that's how we come to be involved with you, for example, to broaden that conversation. And what's really interesting is if, if we were any non-Aboriginal landowner at the scale we are, and I can think of a couple of names of people in Western Sydney who are that, we would have the red the, the other traditional owners of Western <laughs> That's right. Western we, the, the dairy farming a part of the game. We 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 would have the red carpet rolled out for us, but it's very difficult for government to work with land councils because they're not used to land councils being in those rooms. It's kind so of, it's kind of really, fascinating. The, the great owners of Western Sydney, Chooks, dairy farmers, and blackfellas. This sort absolutely, of absolutely. Massive land ownership, which is which is changes changes the balance. It so, does. We mentioned, mentioned before the audacity of land rights claims. Nothing more audacious than Parramatta Jail. Um, the place where I always grew up being threatened if I played up, that's where I'd end up. As Me too. Kid, this incredible sandstone, almost demonic for the outside, fearful place um, that now... To take us through when you, you launch your audacious claim, Derriman, to take Parramatta Jail, and then maybe also let us know about the government's response when they had to give it up. Of course. So uh, the history of the jail acquisition goes back to before my time with Derriman when I was the registrar of the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. And so part of one of my jobs in those days was to register land claims. And so in my time as registrar, I, I think I registered about 20-odd thousand land claims, uh, of which the Parramatta Jail claim was one. And what essentially happened was, was that Derriman was very astute and had been watching a number of um, government sites or, or assets, if you like, to see what was going on and understood that corrective services wanted to move from Parramatta Jail because it was an old site and they wanted to modernise, you know, Parkley, Lithgow, others that they're now building. And so when the jail was finally closed for the third time, 
in 2011, Derebin promptly lodged a land claim for the jail site itself, so within the sandstone. Which out was of the blue, like they knew it was coming or they literally put I, their hands they, down? They, on the... they knew exactly what their timing was, yep. The government didn't know they were coming. It was oh, timed. That, that's interesting. I've had conversations since then with some people saying, we told them this would happen, we told them this would happen. So um, I think it was an uneven, uh, uneven understanding on the government side. Let's put it that way. So after you register it, you, it's got, mm. what's that, what's the re, a very responsible and mature approach from government or? So what government did was take one look at it and refuse it in, in double quick time. But of course, what Derebin had already done, because Derebin had been in this game for many, many years, Derebin's lawyers, Chalk and Barrent, solicitors in Sydney, one of Australia's leading Aboriginal law firms, um, have been acting for Derebin since the 19, late 1980s, right? So very long relationship. The moment it was refused, appeal, the appeal was prepared because all land claims are determined by ministers administering the Crown Lands Act yep. and then fully fully appealable as merit appeals to the Land Environment Court. Um, the matter went to the Land Environment Court. The proceedings commenced. People started sending out subpoenas, all the usual litigation fun and games. And late in the piece, the the government gave up and, and did not wish to defend the matter and uh, agreed to the orders to transfer the jail and about four point hectares outside the jail at the back, which is really, really important land for that whole North Parramatta precinct. So Derriman, in fact, got the jail and an extra 4.8 hectares. But in exchange terms, there was no make good from government. You got it in situ, right, as is, garbage on the floor, and just walked away through the keys. Derriman got handed a big old jail key, which is exactly how you'd imagine it out of Central Castle. <laughs> And that's about it. But that's okay. We've, we've come we've come a fair way since then. Yeah. It's quite remarkable. In terms of this, it's right at the very core of this proposed Parramatta Heritage Precinct. Absolutely. Next to the, the campus, the future campus for Sydney University, enabled by a light rail, nearly knocked around by urban growth, but everyone survived that. Um, it must be this uh, tremendous. And it just, and it's, there's lots of sites you have. It's it's the one more retail focused that you know, um, you know. If the, um, That's right. And people look, can understand. I can't, I can't express to you enough how how proud the Derebin mob is of their achievement. Both, it is it is the most important land claim success in the history of the Act, just in terms of sheer kind of presence, if you like. And it's built form too, rather than open country. Um, there's been some great land right wins over the years, but it's a real real shining light. And what Derebin's taken great pride in is, is then moving to become a really important part of that vision for both yep. the Westmead Place, if you like, the Westmead Place strategy, and also the Parramatta North Precinct. And so, look, we're, we're partners with the powerhouse. We're talking consistently with those in charge of the Heritage Corps. We're working with Parramatta Council regularly on these issues. We have a, we have a plan for the jail. Um, we have a development application going to Parramatta Council to activate the jail more inside the walls. That'll be lodged in June. So no no building. We're not going to build anything. We're just going to be able to make it a better cultural entertainment precinct. One, uh, of the great, one of the great nights of my life, the Tex Perkins concert. Doing, me too. Um, me too. Doing Folsom Prison Blues in the yard. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So, I mean, uh, more, more power to you and the chance to see those that magnificent Indigenous arts scratched into the walls by a lot of the original stonemasons who were yep. inmates and artisans working in a, its house, an awful lot of Aboriginal Westies over over years, and it's uh, built, built by. So there's a there's a beautiful symmetry to, to bring it back around. Look, yep. I'm conscious of our time. There's a whole range of lands you have available, and I, I don't want people thinking that you know the demonisation of Marbo was the the black girls are coming for your backyard kind of thing. You explained earlier this is a legal transaction between unused government un, unactivated crown land and and the rights to rights to take it at the flip side of that i know the plans of derriban are ultimately to give empowerment to their community so how do you develop it and get the money to put into social programs to provide jobs agribusiness aged housing all sorts of things to to end in some ways the you know the, the tragic dependency welfare dependency that's been partly in the community and to allow economic advancement and innovation within the other end. You've just gone to that point of you've done an awful lot of securing land and now it's into activation. Future must be looking pretty bright for 
those plants. Oh, look, it's a it's a really it's a really good point you raise, and that and and I would go to a phrase that um, our wonderful CEO Kevin Kavanagh has coined, and that is he has said, Derebin chooses to be a developer, but he chooses to be a developer of people rather than just a developer of property, and I think that's a really nice way to sum it up because. If you're the owner of a whole lot of freehold land, you have to use that land to create wealth, to assist your members yeah. and the broader community. You are a private. We are in, we are a small to medium sized business. We are not someone getting a grant every year from government to deliver a service that all citizens should get. And at the moment, you're cash rich. You're land rich, cash cash poor. There's an activation to do those things um, because with with securing land rights, doesn't automatically become development approvals, does it? Is no. It is the next great, well, and we've spoken before, I came up through a political cycle when you had a natural allies of, of the green movement and the black movement on, on land rights and other things. Similarly, we've seen nowadays farmers and miners fighting up in the global plains about gas It's putting two natural constituents in our pitch battle. Uh, are you are you disappointed that there's an awful, well, there's a good portion of the green movement and the, the green planning movement that's saying, well, now all that all that blackfellow land is perfect for us to lock up and not be developed. Um, is it a second wave of maybe better intention colonialism again to tell you what to do with your own I, land? I think it's interesting. I think I think that's probably been a mindset for a while, but I think it's changing. And I think that there will be in future much more nuanced and sophisticated conversations between right. the environment movement and Aboriginal land councils and Derriban in particular. What I would say is. Land Rights 2.0, as Derebin is like to call it, which is the activation stage, who can't understand how to make that right is the New South Wales government. And we know how broken the planning system is for everybody. It's even more broken for land councils because the government is just not used to land councils being on that terrain and they want to keep imagining they can create an Aboriginal box and that's where all that gets done. It's not the case. We should be treated like everybody else. You didn't we, fight those battles to have scrubby bushland handed over and left untouched for. Correct. You said they're not national parks. You won. These are. This is not designated great green spaces. This was. If it was, you know, should have put a ring on it, or it were it national park worthy before it would have been. Well and truly, it's also been a good defence mechanism for government land to some extent, hasn't it? Look, can I tell you that the 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 Derriban, as we speak, has a proposal before the New South Wales government with two ministers, which says we will return nine hundred and twenty six hectares of private land in the Penrith LGA for biodiversity conservation. Wow. We will develop a four hundred and ten hectare agribusiness precinct together with the Western Parkland City Authority, Sarah Hill's wonderful outfit. We will dedicate 220 hectares for a broad acre bushland cemetery, which can go along with the one at Wallachia if that survives. And we will do that together with the Minister for, for Cemeteries, Melinda Pavey. And we will have 381 hectares left over for life. I, I, I hear that's a dead end job. So we've got a, we've got a 2,000 hectare land settlement in front of the government now, and we, we need them to respond because that's internationally significant, Chris, in terms of land use outcomes, but also outcomes between the Crown and yeah. Aboriginal communities. That, that's a caring for country within the, that, that yep. activation, which is, which is amazing. Hey, conscious of your time, Steve, let me get to some uh, sort of broader issues with, um, you know, I know you're not speaking as, in, as First Nations man, but certainly on behalf of Derriban, Derriban today. Is it very easy for all of us, as you said, to do the rap, to acknowledge country and say we're done now? Is it, are you, are you, concerned or is Derebin concerned that a society that's put a whole lot of effort into to honouring culture in, a, in one sense, but then when push comes to shove, it, it's still there when you try to develop your own land or get proper economic empowerment. Oh, no, no, we, we acknowledge country and we did a rap plan and we were, you know, we threw a couple of jobs on the multi-million dollar project your way. Is there a concern that we need to redouble the effort that, that the ceremonial has replaced the, the actual? Um, I think you're right to say this, this, the, the white ceremonial has replaced the actual. A couple of things I'd say about this. I would encourage anyone to read Laura Tingle's quarterly essay, which was the second one before the latest one, where she, you know, shows us, as is so easy to do these days, how much better the Kiwis are than us. And 
one of the one of the things she talks about in that essay and has responded to really well in the responses in the following quarterly essay is the way that uh, Pakaya and Murray have have come along their journey and the importance of treaty making. And I think this is why on a national level, we just have to accept that the Uluru Statement opens a door that it is worth walking through. And it has to be walked through because the truth telling is the key. And then the Aboriginal communities, whether they're traditional owner groups or land councils or otherwise, will simply assert their rights and work in partnership with governments. The biggest problem I find in this state at the moment is the Crown still thinks it is in control. And it never, as we know, governments never have as much control as they think, but they have to let go of their control over Aboriginal people and forge partnerships, not just welcome, welcome, welcome. There's possibly said nothing that scares the Crown more than Aboriginal with a big land portfolio. And, uh, <laughs> That's part of my fun day job. That's part of my fun day job. <laughs> Steve, thank you, mate. Please pass on to Kevin Athol and the and the Durban board people our thanks. We are delighted not only to have you, uh, Durban, as one of the prime, you know, effectively the major voice for Indigenous community in the biggest Indigenous community in Australia, being Western Sydney, but also one of its major landowners. Now, this is a unique position. It's come about through a lot of hard work by people um, over many years to achieve it off the back of a good public policy originally. Um, it's done without frightening the horses and people's mortgages, the demonisation that came out of the next wave of, of land rights and others. And it's now being put to good purpose, activation appropriate of, of land use for returning for not-for-profit communities um, to provide employment, environmental protection, and, um, and, and hope in sometimes people who've uh, for 200 years haven't had enough haven't had enough hope. So uh, more strength to you, my friend. And um, we're looking forward to the first time when uh, Tex Perkins is back at Paramount Jail. Let us know. It was one of one of the great shows of all time. And the opportunity to do so much more at Paramount is just remarkable. Well, the, 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 plan is, the plan is a double bill of Tex Perkins and Troy Casadaly. So it should be a fun oh. night. <laughs> we'll all be there. We'll let them know. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate the opportunity.